meditation I would like to uh, reflect a bit on the first part of the first verse of the eight point might transformation and this uh, line is with the thought of attaining awakening for the welfare of all beings with the thought of attaining awakening for the welfare of all beings so this is bodhicitta body awakening chitta heart so the awakening heart So we will look into the different levels of spiritual practice in the next chapter. But when we reflect upon what is actually my intention, why do I practice? Why, do, why, why am I here tonight? So what is my yearning? What is my longing? So that's the start, yeah? to, uh, to reflect upon this, uh, this sentence, to kind of check how much of my intention is still to feel better. So how much uh, of my spiritual practice is actually carried by the needs of the narrative self? And then appreciating, that's where I am, that's at the moment a drive in my practice. I want to feel better, I want to be more compassionate, I, so, it's like this, spiritual practice is part of the story of the narrative self. And uh, with that intention we have not entered the Mahayana path. So this text starts with the invitation to, to go deeper, to, to go deeper than the what about me, what do I get out of this for me, what is interesting here for me, what can I take from this weekend for myself. to go deeper than that. So the Mahayana path is not about you at all. It's not for you. You, what you think you are, will not get anything from this. You, what you think you are, has to die. You, what you think you are, will never awaken. You can't bring yourself into awakening. You as what you think you are. So what we are searching here for, or what we allow to reveal itself is something bigger than you. It is revealing the love which wants to emerge from this being.
and it has nothing to do with you. It's not in your hands. You can't get it, you as the narrative self. So is there something within you, or something ancient, something which has nothing to do with Oh, I should be better, I should be more compassionate, I should think less of me. You know, that's all the dialogues of the narrative self. I should, I should uh, think better of me. I, so all that is the dialogues of the narrative self. But isn't there also a something, you can't put your finger on it, something bigger? something which doesn't come from your thoughts and something which breaks through your life sometimes, even if you maybe try to repress it. Something in you which knows that it is all about love. Something which is not localized in you as something findable. So let's sit quietly. In the space of your awareness. Appreciating how feelings and thoughts and sensations and sounds, memories, and also the sense of I is like waves in the shortest ocean of consciousness. might be helpful to rest lightly with the breath and appreciating the spacious aliveness which becomes available when you dissolve the image of the body the I stories, sliding back into present moment awareness when you get hooked by the internal dialogue you unhook
then I invite you to connect with the goodness within you, the softness, the gentleness, or the capacity of warmth. capacity to care. And you can start with your pets and with your family, with your friends. be a sense that, that there's love wanting to emerge from your voice, from the way you look at people, from the way you touch people. There might be a yearning, a longing to be harmless. be a longing or yearning to be relevant in the healing of the world. your energy, your creativity to benefit others. to want to give selflessly without agenda. rest. You say to yourself, in your mind, may this being awaken for the benefit of all. May 
say this being a light in the world. May this being be a source of peace. being be a source of joy, of hope. this being wake up from the nightmare of the narrative self. May this being heal and grow up to make this place a better place. May everything this being says or does benefit others. And I want to conclude with uh, Shanti Devas first from the Bodhisattva Tara. As long as space remains, as long as my children suffer, my parents, my friends. I shall too remain in order to serve. support in order to contribute as long as space remains as long as there are feeling suffering beings I too will remain their pain.
as long as space remains, as long as, as long as there are feeling living beings, I too shall remain beneath them in order to help. So the whole first is with the thought of attaining awakening for the welfare of all beings who are more precious than a wish-fulfilling Jew. I will constantly practice holding them dear. So I will constantly practice holding, holding them dear. That's what I want to reflect a little upon. Yeah. So holding them dear, hold, holding all beings dear, it's not the prescription, it's the description of the goal. Doesn't say anything about how to get there, how to make that arise within us. And sometimes people confuse that. So you, you get these teachings, okay, I should hold all beings deep. I'm not doing it, but I should. And I can pretend that I do. Can, I can lie to myself and others. Or I can Use, use it as putting myself down. Look what a bad person you are. You should hold other beings dear, but actually you give a shit and you show it through the way you live your life. So I'm a bad person. <clears throat> so if we would hold all beings dear, we would be awakened. So what prevents us to hold beings dear? Is there something we can let go of there? And how can we how can we actually make us want to hold all the, all, all beings dear? I mean, that would be a good start. And a lot of the Lam Rim teachings, they are exactly about that. You know, they pick us up where we are, wanting to feel better in the future for myself. And then carefully, they help us to want to aspire to hold all, thing, all beings as dear. I mean, when you hear holding all 
beings as dear, no, there should be resistance. Maybe not so much here, I don't know. But in most people, there would be resistance. Yeah, I can hold my family dear. I can hold the people who are in my right political view dear. I can hold people who are nice and kind dear. But fascists, killers, rapists, terrorists, the bad people, the evil people, I, I should hold them dear? No, they are bad. They deserve to be punished. I don't want them to hold dear. So if we don't struggle with this, then we actually really don't really hear the message, how radical it is. It is the message of Jesus, it is the message of the Buddha, the message of Gandhi. I just saw the movie, this old movie. I saw as a teenager. So that's uh, something to you know, really explore. So what, you know, what? How can I? How can I invoke that spirit in me? The spirit of bodhicitta. And the most profound way, and then later in the text we go into some more provisional ways, but the most profound way is the view of non-duality, which is what is Buddhism is about. The Buddhist tradition is a mystic tradition, a non-dual tradition. You hold everything dear because it's you. You hold everything dear as you hold your own right hand dear. I mean, you don't need to meditate upon what are the reasons to hold this hand dear. How can I cultivate a care towards my hand. How can I learn to remove the thorns from my own flesh? No, it's the most natural thing to do because it's me and I protect me. So now in the distorted view of the narrative self, the me ends here. And sometimes the car and the iPhone is included. <laughs> or the children. So that the me, or that what we call me, that that is arbitrary, made up. That's probably some people experience that for the first time when they have children. Suddenly the problems of another person, another person, a separate person, become your problem. even maybe more than your own problems. So the non-dual the non-dual view, the non-dual experience 
is the experience of the wave being the ocean. And the way, so this is a story, yeah? so this is concepts, and there might be responses to that, to that concepts, but this is how it is. <laughs> and in the Lam Rim, in the gradual path to awakening, we learn the steps to discover that. That we, that we, the wave, was never separate from the ocean. So imagine, imagine this pu pure, uh, this poor, confused wave, which makes up a story of I, and separates herself from the ocean, and then hates the other waves. because they are bigger or more interesting or so with the ex with the experience of no self you are there it's not a thought or oh, i need to hold all things dear all beings dear it's just the most natural things which emerges from the experience of no self. So this is probably one of the most important insights we hopefully aspire to have is the insight into the emptiness. The insight that there is nobody there except the one you make up that there is nothing to defend here. For the narrative self, this is very scary because what that means is that the problems of the world are your problems. Not, not only now, usually we think of our problems. We are completely occupied all the time about ourselves. We, we here as a narrative self, not, not we as, a, as our true self, but I as the narrative self. It's quite shocking to, to observe what we think about. It's quite shocking to observe what kinds of problems we try to solve. It's quite shocking to, to observe whom we want to make happy. So if it, if it is seen that that which we want to make happy does not exist, then only love makes sense. Only generosity makes sense. So until we are there, I mean, we are already there, but uh, until we look from there, 
you know, because right now we look from the narrative self, from the central position of the narrative self. That's our perspective. So until we look from there, fortunately, um, in Buddhism you find step-by-step step provisional placebos which uh, are somehow interesting for the narrative self. So what does help you? I mean, you don't need to answer that question. This is like an invitation to reflect. What does help you in your own reflections, in, in, in the way you look at people, to be more open, to be more forgiving, to be more, to feel more connected. You know, what does help you in your own what? I mean, maybe we, we, we initially have to start, how can you make this being interested in only looking with love at other people? Can you make this being interested in that? And how do you do that? It's a beautiful aspiration. May only, love, may only love shine through my eyes upon other people. Sounds right somehow. Something in you probably feels, yeah, that's the right way to go. That's beautiful. Because then you can start to ask how. How can I make that happen? So there is some reflection within the Lojong teachings on that, how to make that happen once you want it, once you genuinely want it. And some of them are not so helpful. For example, making a leap of faith into the everlasting, continuous stream of consciousness without beginning, which manifests in this being, you have had countless lovers, children, and mothers and fathers in countless lives. So every being you need, meet, everyone you see, at one point has been taken care of you. And now this person who somewhere in the past was so close to you, you couldn't stand to be separated from her for one minute. and the best place in the universe was her lab. That person suffers through violence, through anger, through hatred. It's a bit like you know, having, let's say, imagine you have a good relationship to your mother. Just imagine. You really love her and you appreciate her for what she did for you. Probably you don't, but 
Let's imagine. And then towards the end of this life, your mother develops a kind of paranoia and starts to attack you. Would you love her less? Or could you look behind? Could you see her paranoid attacks as confusion? And could you see her suffering and be even more compassionate? more loving. So this, what I just did, it was a guided meditation using a, a Lojong teaching. This example is re very relevant uh, uh, for me in my life right now. And you can, you can check within you, you know, what I just said. Is that something in you for you? Maybe not exactly like that. Maybe you reject the idea of the everlasting stream of consciousness which manifests as this being. Yeah? So then you then one, then one can find like a different a different 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 way. Because you can't force yourself by saying, yeah she was my mother in my previous life. This is like this kind of parrot Buddhist talk. But nothing changes, nothing moves. So you start to notice that this lojong is working for you if you notice, yes, I can actually allow these attacks to pass through. I don't need to respond to them. I don't take them personal. And I see the suffering in the other person. So you, you notice that there's more space, there's more love, less reactivity. And slowly, slowly, it becomes a way of being. So you don't need to have that talk. Yeah, she was my mother in previous lives and so on and so on. You don't need that. There is that openness. What the narrative self does is, it's called cognitive fusion. What the narrative self does is, when some, someone acts to you, and you, you experience it as an attack, there is a cognitive fusion of that action with the person. So the person who is criticizing you, who is attacking you, is narrowed down to that action and is perceived as an evil person, as a bad person, as a predator. Someone who actually deserves to be punished. We do the same with us. So there's an aspect of you, something, something you're ashamed of, something you don't like, and you identify with it, and you say, I'm not good enough. <laughs> 
So we identify with one part of our experience and there's a cognitive fusion with the I and that part of ourselves. Am I communicating? And with that, that is a perspective, with that we lose the connection with the complexity of ourselves and the complexity of another person. So, I found it really helpful to think of me and of others with that as systems, family systems, like a family system with many aspects. And in these aspects, there are hurt aspects. In you are hurt aspects. Hurt sub-personalities, you could say. Hurt family members. And sometimes, one of this hurt family member drives the car. And then we think we are that. Or we think the other person is that. And when we look deeply in our, into ourselves, and that's the only way to understand it in others. When we look deeply in, into ourselves, then we start to see that that aspect which is leashing out onto others, which is looking hard at others, which is jealous, that aspect which wants to harm, that that is a hurt aspect. It is an aspect which is suffering. an aspect which actually needs love and compassion, understanding, nourishment, healing. So when we start to see that in ourselves, and, you, and, and so this is something like this, this really honest, deep journey into your being, into your experience, and and stopping to deny that there is that nasty, hurtful aspect in me that also helps then not to project that just outside. But what you then start to see and understand is, oh, poor little girl, I know. It was really tough. You deserve better. You know, now I'm grown up, I can take care of you, you can relax. You don't need to, you, you don't need to be a killer. And when you can do that with yourself, with the different members of the internal family system, then you also start to see that in others. You start to see it in Trump. You start to see it in those people where the narrative self would say, how can anyone ever do this? These people are evil. Then they deserve to be killed. So one way to hold every, everyone dear is to see the complexity. It 
is to see the goodness starting uh, starting with connecting with your own goodness and is starting to see in yourself that your violence comes from a hurt place. So this is this was also a guided meditation. So it it was using reflection to change our perspective in the way we look at people. Before the perspective was this cognitive fusion of the narrative self, which you become aware of. Yeah, that's right, this person criticizes me, so this person is an enemy. And everyone, everyone, by the way, should agree upon that this person doesn't deserve to be here and is a bad person. Slandering, talking about this person, inviting other people into our distortive, into our distortive perspective. So you become aware of it. And then we test it. Okay, so can I think about this differently? Can I relate to this differently? Can I give this a different meaning? Is there something else which I don't see in the cognitive distortion? And then you might feel, yeah, it actually helps me to be more forgiving, more open. It actually, it's not just, yeah, I have to think like that or something. It is actually, you start to see people like that. You start to see people as processes, as multidimensional processes with no eye there. with no center, nobody is in charge. If someone would be in charge, okay, let's destroy that one or one. But there is nobody. In the same way, he is, nobody is, he is in charge. This is just a bundle of habits, of hurts, and of Buddha nature. So the, the, the process of holding other people dear really start with, starts with introspection and holding yourself dear. Uh, holding yourself dear, not holding I dear, because there is no I, but holding the members of the internal family system to hold them dear and to invite them back and to understand, to really see, that they actually all want to protect you. That which is violent in us, actually wants to protect us. It's hurt, it doesn't trust, and it wants to protect the family. And it doesn't trust you, you as Buddha nature, you as a grown-up person. The same is for other people. So that doesn't mean that we are supposed... Oh, is, it, is that the time? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it was such a good story. <laughs> okay, so let's continue tomorrow. And let's uh, finish the evening with a short dedication.
appreciating that we took the time and appreciating that uh, we created this space together. How fortunate we are to have access to these Mojong teachings and appreciating the presence of the awakened heart uh, through the Buddha, through the Dalai Lama. Appreciating that we have a safe refuge, a safe direction in life through the Buddha Dharma. And may this being awaken so that it can awaken others. May this being, may this being awaken for the benefit of all. Okay, thank you very much. Tomorrow, definitely questions. And we continue at 10 o'clock. Bye. Good night.